place where your only weapon is your wits and the towel around your waist. An establishment that is a bar, a casino, and a brothel that people of all strata pack into to look for opportunity and to conduct business. A small hill where House Strauss built its great citadel that links to the tangled docks and warehouses along the Argent River. A district with opulent painted brick houses of the city's richest and oldest families stand in the place where the great old Strauss clock tolls the hours. Hey everyone, welcome to That Midgard Show, a podcast dedicated to discussing the Midgard campaign setting published by our friends at Cobalt Press. I'm your co-host, Clayton Thompson, and I manage the Midgard Adventures Discord server, an independent fan-based cooperative group that is affiliated with Cobalt Press. There we talk lore, share tips and tricks, answer questions, and offer organized play games, both online and IRL. Our community is open to everyone, particularly those new to Midgard and role-playing games in general. So check us out. We have an invitation link available in the show notes below. Hello, everybody. I'm Joe Ticello. I've been playing D&D for about 28 years now as both a GM and as a player. I started my YouTube channel, GM Toolbox, about a year and a half ago to help GMs and even players get the most out of their RPG games uh, in a setting agnostic manner. I talk about different tools, tricks, materials, I use to enhance my games and hopefully help you enhance yours. I also like to review third-party books, Patreons, Kickstarters, digital tools, and really anything else that can help you uh, enhance your RPG games. Uh, so, so subscribe to my channel and uh, get notified when videos come out. So we recorded so much material for episode four, we decided to break it up into two episodes. So we're recording new material today uh, for episode five, that is going to be paired with uh, some material uh, from uh, what we recorded for episode four. So you may see, you know, a little bit different uh, shirts on, um, references to a, a time when we were recording. Um, but uh, essentially, you know, we have a great show for you today. So, Joe, how's your games going? Uh, you know, well, considering uh, it really has only been a few days uh, since we did our other recording, I haven't had much of a time uh, to play, uh, but I have been kind of playing with some of the play tests for Black Flag. So kind of excited oh. about that. But uh, aside from that, I did get to play in uh, one game over the weekend. That was a lot of fun. Uh, got to play as my barbarian character and do a little bit of exploring and uh, some just beating up on people. Uh, it was a fun kind of fun encounters with these uh these brother tanners that uh, we've been kind of investigating. We have this golden mask that is uh, tied to the Demogorgon. And we had to, we, we, we kind of found this mask. We we're hiding it from bad people. Well, bad people found the mask and took it. And uh, they're using it to cause kind of insanity and stuff like that. So in our efforts to track it down, we came to this tanner shop that these brothers have been, I guess, coerced or perhaps corrupted uh, to attack us. So we had this really cool fight. Uh, and the DM was pretty cool because he let me kind of, you know, run up the stairs, uh, tackle this guy who was shooting a rifle down. Like I basically kind of got to tackle him off the balcony, land on the ground, take my second attack and smash him. So it was pretty cool. It was a good session. Uh, and, you know, just kind of enjoying, uh, getting to enjoy playing a little bit as opposed to running my own games recently, which has been a nice change of pace, but I did mention last, uh, you know, last episode about starting uh, a campaign with my daughter and her friends. So that's kind of underway. We're, we're getting those invitations out, starting to little kind of work on some character concepts. And then me and her are also looking at getting that one-on-one uh, -on -one game going with her, her warlock character out of uh, the Toma Heroes book, which is going to be absolutely so much fun. I'm really, really looking forward to, to getting that game underway and, seeing how that character shakes out. So, yeah, that's about it. How about you, man? Yeah, Joe, yeah, a lot of gaming. Uh, we're still uh, doing a lot of Curse of Strahd, you know, our Midgard version of that. And uh, if you remember from the last episode, our heroes defeated the evil Piccolo Blinsky, who is the twin 
uh, brother of Gadolf Blinsky, who is part of the original adventure. And, you know, if you remember Piccolo, he, he's the guy who's manufacturing these evil dolls called carionettes, uh, which are essentially made out of the leftovers of the dream cake manufacturing process. Last session, if, if you recall, Jean-Claude used an ability that allows him to see through walls and, and just see shadows if there's a, an empty space on the other side. And in that, he did find a room and in it, he saw this large creature breaking through his restraints that was binding him to the lab table. Uh, he got up, walked over to an, another table, picked up this round object that uh, looks like a flat brim hat and he just popped it on his head. And he suddenly morphs into kind of a, a, a smaller human form, uh, thinner in statue. Um, so the characters, you know, after they found out uh, what John Claude saw, you know, they uh, headed down a, another hallway that they haven't explored and uh, found a set of double doors that led them into this lab of sorts. Um, you know, in it, there were many work tables with lab equipment all over, burners heating up various shades of liquid. And on the table in front of them, there was this large body that was pieced together from different body parts. And it looked like whoever was assembling it needed to attach an arm, uh, which was on the table next to the uh, body. Uh, but, you know, the body was missing a pretty important extremity, you know, a head. And, you know, so they just started exploring more. But, uh, but coming out of the shadows, you know, there's a hallway in the back of the room, uh, was this uh, figure uh, that uh, Jean-Claude, you know, thought he saw. And... And, and what they see in the room is this humanoid, you know, kind of making a threatening gesture with a bowl. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, he's, he's, he's wearing like clothes made out of gold lame. He, he, he was wearing a, a, a gold sombrero cordobes, you know, trimmed with feathers. And that's essentially a Spanish Polaro hat and wearing this gold mask. And, uh, and, he just kind of smiles and says, who are you? Are you Fred or foe? And, uh, and then the human just kind of gave him a salute, turned around and started heading down the, the, the hallway he, he emerged from. But, uh, you know, the party just kind of stood there uh, where they were standing, a little gobsmacked. Uh, and uh, they were just expecting him to come back because they knew the door he was heading to was locked. And uh, so they just sat there and waited for that uh, strange human to uh, return, which he did. And he uh, kind of emerges from the shadows again, you know, like, uh, uh, hello, friends. Uh, yeah, that that looks kind of embarrassing. Huh? And, uh, <laughs> and and they, they, they're just like, who is this guy? So, you know, one one member of the party um uh, Lazar, who uh, is our ranger, you know, decided I'm going to go to the back of the room and talk to this guy. Uh, the rest says, ah, we'll let Lazar deal with this guy. Uh, we're going to explore the uh, lab. And uh, while they were doing that, they found these very large glass jars, each with uh, heads bobbing up and down slowly uh, in an amber uh, viscous liquid. And, you know, these were human uh, looking heads. Uh, one of them, uh, uh, humanoid heads you know one of them was human and the other one was was uh had pointed ears and 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 looked to, to be at, at a minimum elf marked uh you know half elf in 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 D, D parlance um so geisel you know or fighter you know she bent down to get a closer look at the heads and you know as she's looking at them you know the eyes just snapped open on both heads you know it just kind of made her startle back she started drawing her sword you know ready to attack the jar um, but uh, she kind of came to her senses uh, um, a little bit and she sees the the heads, you know, just kind of, you know, doing this, you know, and and, and mouthing some words that uh, she can't understand. And then, you know, they, they finally just bobbed to the top and, you know, kind of banged on the, the heavy glass lid for a little bit. And then, you know, she just says, all right, I'll, I'll open the lids, you know, what's a head going to do? Um, and uh, she pulled off the lid and the the uh the head surfaced and they they started talking to her hey how you doing i'm so and so you know get us out of here and uh she's like what am i supposed to do with you carry you in my backpack 
<laughs> and you know the the heads were you know kind of trying to convince her that you know taking them with them was a a, a good good sign or a, a good thing to do. But um, you know back to Lazar and the uh, and the gold trimmed uh, uh, human. Um, the Lazar kind of just started to question, "Who are you?" why are you here you know the the usual normal questions and uh you know the um the humanoid basically you know responded by saying you know i'm diego and uh i was uh captured by by morgantha and uh tied to this table i i woke up hearing you know some uh, commotion in in the room next to me and i you know was able to you know gain enough strength and break my straps and 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 find my stuff and you know all he, all he really found was his hat um and you know there there's more interrogation you know that uh, went on um you know for a little bit but uh but uh, then Lazarus started asking you know what's up with these heads and and this body and you know he explained that uh you know piccolo and morgantha were you know so in this body and uh, their intentions were to attach the heads or one of the heads to the to the body, and that's kind of where we left it, you know, for for the session. You know, um, you know, there's two heads, you know, there's one body. There there's a newcomer who who nobody knows whether to trust or not, and you know, we'll find out in the next recap a recap what happened next. Dude, that sounds awesome. I'm totally getting Futurama vibes from the heads. <laughs> like, I hope you did one of them in a Dixon voice. <laughs> Well, no. What uh, one of them was a Kriff, and uh, and and one of them was, you know, your 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 half elf uh, uh, creature. That and, been... uh, <laughs> and 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 the yeah. The, but the funny thing about the head is the the head was looking at Lazar and calling him Bob. You know, Bob, where you've been, Bob? Why'd you leave? Yeah, you that's know? funny. And and, and Lazar's just standing there like, who's Bob? Yeah. So. Yep. Uh, I, you know, you, you've been for multiple episodes now, you've been kind of filling us in on your Curse of Strahd game set in Midgard. Um, I bet people would be curious, and I've had the question pop up before. Uh, where did you, where, where in Midgard, maybe maybe you can, we can flash the map up on the screen here, but where in Midgard did you put uh, Curse of Strahd? Like, where, where did you decide to set uh, Barovia and all that? Well, that's a secret. That's a secret. Oh. Yeah. Now it, I know it, we, we have it. We we have a channel in Discord in our Midgard Adventures Discord dedicated to Curse of Strahd in Midgard. So if anybody has questions about you know how Clayton's doing this and or any other people are, are running it, should definitely come over to the Discord and check it out because there is a lot of discussion around it. But yeah. it is pretty now. Cool. What what I will say is in um, in the hardcover, uh, Barovia is in its own demi plane, right? And uh, in Midgard. Barovia is still in its in its own demi plane, but it is in a particular location uh, on the Midgard map. Okay. Well, and, and the gonna... reason I'm being so uh, evasive right now is because my my characters don't know. Your player, uh, yeah, and your players. My you don't players, want your players to the podcast. Yeah, my players don't out. know, and they watch the show. Okay. So. Okay. Fair enough. But if anybody yeah. wants to know. You know, you, you know where to come to find out some answers and, and get some questions because that is probably one of the most popular um, uh, official 5e campaigns that people want to play in Midgard. So, yeah, we do have an entire channel dedicated to that, that, that you know, people discuss it and it's pretty cool. And, you know, I know uh, a few people are playing some other, you know, official ones like Storm King's Thunder is on there as well yeah. that people are playing. So we've got some channels dedicated to that one. Um, I don't know if you have any experience with any of them, but that's a good one. I don't have experience with that one, but uh, I, I do know that a couple of GMs have uh, kind of done a Midgard conversion of it and uh, placed it in the Northlands. Um, okay, makes sense. Another cool part of the continent that uh, yeah. you know, we'll talk about in future episodes. But uh, you know, it's it's not hard to to basically move an adventure from one location to another. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a good comparable place uh, for uh, any of the Everything. adventures. Yeah in in midgard yeah i mean i would i would argue that you could probably do something like um dragon heist right in zobek yeah absolutely zobek would be so. a perfect perfect setting for that so yeah. you know on the server you know we allow our gms to run any adventure that they want um just so long as they uh place it in uh 
in, in Midgard. Yeah, Midgard. And, yeah. and a lot of them has had an easy time with it. You know, they just change a few names. And and uh, for Curse of Strahd, you know, I swapped out the Kariv for the Vistani. And uh, so, yeah, there's definitely a, a, a comparable material in Midgard. Awesome. Well, you know, I'd say at this point, let's jump into the topic of the day. So if you guys see a bit of a weird transition here, you know, that's because, like we said, we we, re, we recorded most of this previously and uh, decided to break it up into two episodes. But let's talk about more Zobek stuff. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we start with Upper Zobek? You know, since we're, we're starting with the uh, government, you know, we might as well just walk out of City Hall uh, right into the uh, Crown Square. And it's kind of the right. newest place to be seen uh, around it's town. It's happening place. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's there's tall houses all, all along the edge of the Council Hall, the city archives, and uh, the homes of the wealthiest and most powerful families in the city, such as the Greymarks, the Vanderick, uh, the Ar Armanac, uh, the Horovitz, and the Spyglass, you know. And it's also where you know, the great Strauss clock uh, is, you know, it's, it's, their homes are very colorful, literally, you know, they're, they're painted bright blue, yellow, red, uh, and that paint is always refreshed, you know, so those houses look, you know, very yeah. tip top. So very Amsterdam, -y, you know, really. Yeah. Um, right. That's the nice part of town. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely a nice part of town. Um, you know, this is the place where everybody comes to party on major holidays and state occasions. Uh, thousands gather in the square. And how would you like to have your front yard as, as a place of where uh, uh, prisoners are executed as well? You know, and, you know, that, that that's some of the, the the less fun stuff, you know, that happens in the Crown Square, you know. So, well, you it know, seems like the citizens enjoy it, though, right? Like, you notice, like, whenever you're watching those movies, whenever there's hangings, everyone's like, let's go watch the hanging. <laughs> Yeah, like it's like, yeah, it's it's a popular attraction in Zobac. Like, let's go watch the bad guys get hung. Those yeah, girls, yeah, you know? so that's reality what TV, <laughs> reality TV yeah. before there was TV. Yeah. Um, you know, in the area, you know, there's the jail called the Red Rock Bailey, and that lies just down the street uh, behind the Civic Courthouse. And and the trip between the Red Rock into the square, there's a, it's 200 yards, uh, along a wide road. You know, there's the executioner's cart, you know, that rolls along at least once a month uh, where common murderers, uh, fraudsters, smugglers, uh, bandits um, are uh, typically uh, executed. And there's not so, a lot of commercial interest in, in the Crown Square. It's, you know, it's government and it's and it's the houses of the rich people. But there are a couple, you know, there's a small tavern called the Red Pig. Uh, and the enormously wealthy Merchant Bank of Yorn and uh, Fetterhahn. And, you know, uh, we're, we're calling this the, you know, the Crown Square. And it's, it should be noted that, you know, that name is one of the, the last remnants of the old uh, Strauss, you know, rule. Uh, it, call, just calling it Crown Square in general. They actually tried to rename it to uh, Great Folk Square, and the name just never really stuck. So it, it's just there's, you know, the Strauss clock and the Crown Square are one of the very few remnants of those days that just kind of hung on. Yeah. Yeah, so there's three uh, areas that is uh, not described very well in, in the book. You know, they're just kind of... Uh, you know, a passing uh, uh, a sentence, you know, and that's the, you know, the city archives, the courthouse and the council hall, believe it or not. Um, so in, in my mind, you know, these areas are ripe for your own imagination. And, uh, you know, as the city archives, you know, for example, this could be a building that goes super deep underground, multiple levels, you know, even for uh, deeper than the, the cartways uh, ever go. It could have whatever you want in it. Ledgers, uh, records, uh, government records going back to the beginning, deeds, um, Strauss family records, titles, birth birth certificates. Blueprints to, to houses or buildings that you might have to break into. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, you know, that, that's a great place, you know, to have your, your characters uh, sneak in and try to find some information and, and you know, again, you know, make it your own, you know. Um, I, I, I even imagine, and, and this isn't part of the lore, but I even imagine that uh, there could be a secret entrance to the Great Stroth Library that no one knows about, even, even the archivists Ooh. that uh, work there. 
you know, so lot, lot, lots of opportunity for you there. Then there's the Civic Courthouse. I've not placed an encounter here yet, but, you know, I kind of envision that it looks like the old Bailey Courthouse in London. Marble building, a mosaic floors, domes, lots of uh, wigged uh, judges and lawyers, just a lot of expensive marble and wood. So if you need a court scene, definitely take your cues from some of the old uh, courthouses in London as as to what they look like, you know. So that's kind of what I envision the uh, the uh, courthouse to be. Uh, the council hall is another sentence in a book, you know. So there's a lot of options for you uh, should you need to have an encounter there. So when I ran Courts of the Shadow Fay a few times, uh, there was a major scene that played out uh, in the council room where the Shadow Fay ambassador walks in, um, interrupts the proceedings, unrolls this big a vellum document and essentially announces to everyone present that the Moonlight King is repossessing the entire crossroads. And uh, since that uh, that scene played out quite a while in there, you know, I needed a, a visual. So uh, the analog I used was the, the council chambers in Belfast City Hall. It was an old style council chamber, a lot of wood, you know, red carpet. And uh, it, it just worked out really well. It really kind of uh, set the set the tone for the pl uh, players as to where their uh, characters are in relationship to everything that's uh, you know happening in the council chambers. You know the players were up in the in the gallery, which was which overlooked the entire uh, council chambers. So, uh, but even before that, you know, I ran an adventure called Hell Comes the Glittering uh, as a lead-in adventure to Courts of the Shadow Fay. Uh, because I needed the PCs to have a relationship with Mayor Olek, uh, who they met at S City Hall in her office, along with the City Watch Captain Horvath Edelstein. Um, and and I, I kind of played up the fact that, uh, you know, he was a little uh, still annoyed um, that the the founders of the Free City of Zobek kind of screwed uh the uh, captains of the city watch and 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 by tradition the the council always included the guild master of the arcane collegium and the cobalt king of kings uh, but you know if you recall our, our one of our last episodes uh during the great revolt you know to get the city watch on their side the leaders gave them a lot their commander a lifetime seat on the uh, council but they but this is where they kind of had their little sleight of hand they secretly decided that unlike the deal they struck with the Kobolds and the Arcane Collegium, this seat for life would only extend to that one individual. So upon his death, uh, the council did not give his position to a successor, uh, but added a second seat for the Cleric of Rava. And to this day, this betrayal remains a point of contention between all of the historical watch captains, all the way up to the current one. Um, so I played up this uh, this uh, tension uh, between uh, the watch commander and the mayor, and I kind of used that as a subplot, uh, you know, for the possibility that uh, he could have been in cahoots with the Shadowfane Bastard uh, on this uh, this repossession effort that they made. And then, you know, we talked about the Red Walk Bailey. Uh, this building is the headquarters of the city watch where uh, the jail is located. And and again, you know, having having been to London many times, you know, I kind of used one of the older Scotland Yard buildings uh, as my inspiration. For me, it's a Red Rock Gothic style building that is primarily a police precinct. It has multiple yeah. levels of jail uh, jail cells underground. It has a morgue, uh, offices of high ranking watchmen, and in fact, in hell comes a glittering, which is in prepared uh, two, by the way. Um, okay. You know, that, that was a murder mystery. And uh, I played a scene there where the guard captain took the PCs to show the bodies of the murder victims. And the twist was the organs of the victims have all been turned to gems. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> What's next? Next would be, probably be the clock tower itself, right? So we mentioned earlier how the clock tower is one of the few things that still maintains the Strauss name. But this thing is really cool. It's kind of a centerpiece of the city, in, in my opinion. Uh, it's, it's Not only is it a clock tower, not only does it track the hours of the day, 
but it actually tracks the phases of the moon, eclipses, sunsets, sunrises. And then there's these two panels that actually show the seasons of the year. So it's this really neat kind of clock, right? It's like one of those ones you get from the, you know, like a watch that has all the cool stuff. Um, but, you know, like I said, despite the revolt, it still has the Strauss name, even in the official language. And it's definitely the focal point of the district, right? Um, r there's even rumors about the clock that it has greater powers. Uh, there's one that talks about a hidden chamber uh, within the clock's uppermost reaches that displays omens related to the fate of the city. Uh, some say that there's a secret chamber containing a gear altar where the souls of all the gear forged are bound. And they, when they die, they return there uh, to serve the city even after their deaths. Uh, and it might even be the seat of the goddess Rava's uh, visitations to the city. Uh, right. So a lot of cool stuff that could be happening there. Um, a lot of the gear forge will even claim that like their flywheels and excavates and all that stuff kind of move and ring with the great clocks chimes. Like they almost claim a, a, a deep, almost spiritual like connection to the clock. So kind of, kind of cool with that. Um, there are some that say the first gear, and I, I, I put that in capitals, the first gear, uh, given to the city by the goddess is, uh, is the prime gear uh, within the Strauss clock, though others will say that uh, uh, it's, you know, in other places like uh, that it turns in the, the Temple of Rava or in the Gear Grinders Guild Hall or something like that. So some contention about that, that particular rumor. Uh, but what is for certain is that the clock is warded by the Collegium. It's protected by furnace golems, uh, animated armor knights, and a bunch of traps. So if you ever do have to get up in there, be prepared to fight your way through it because it's yeah. it's a bit of a, an uphill battle there. Um, the last uh, thing that I know of, at least, and I could be wrong, that still bears the Strauss name is the Strauss Public Bathhouse. Uh, this is a really cool place. I always like bathhouses uh, in cities. I think they're fun places to have interesting encounters. And if, if you remember, I think in episode one, when we did our... our uh, our monster highlight, I chose the bathhouse Drake uh, and because I like putting it in the Strauss public bathhouse. Uh, it, it's this uh, old bathhouse. It lies right there in the, in the heart of Zobeck. Uh, it's located just south of Crown Square and faces uh, the founder statues uh, at the kind of the tip of the crown spike. Uh, and the bath used to only be for the elite, right? The, the Strauss elite. Uh, but after the revolt, uh, it opened up to the general population. So this is kind of one of the few places that, remaining in Zobeck where you can see uh, that lost extravagance of the, the, the old regime. Uh, but the people appreciate it as a reminder and a monument. And the bathhouse is now kind of a shared social space. And, it, and it's dedicated to kind of the triumph of the revolt. Uh, generally, it's kind of considered neutral ground and kind of a sanctuary. Uh, they don't permit weapons or armor inside, except those carried by the watch and official business. Uh, and I know, at least in, in the adventure I was running, the Everyone Lies, they even say, you can't even wear clothes in there. All you get is a towel when you go in. You have There's lockers upstairs. You change into a towel when you go in. So that's that's pretty much it. Um, so given that, uh, it's this, it's not unusual to kind of find, like, you know, a, a trade factor soaking alongside, like, a gang lord or chatting up a guild master. It's just kind of this relaxed, casual environment. And you might find, you know, strange bedfellows uh, uh, talking there and, and you know, uh, making deals and just kind of relaxing together. It, it's very interesting. Uh, there's actually a full map of it uh, in the Zobek book. Uh, and I also actually made my own personal map of it uh, with uh, Dungeon Alchemy. And I posted that for anybody to use in our uh, Discord group. So... You know, if you join our Discord group, there's a map you can use for it. So, uh, but there's a lot of different people uh, that you can find in the bathhouse. Uh, there's this one uh, girl named uh, Sveventhala. Svetlana. Se Svetlana. Svetlana. Yeah. See, I'm bad with names. But Svetlana is this little raven-haired girl. Uh, she's kind of professional, refined. Uh, what's neat about her is she's always speaking in innuendos and insults without ever really... Uh, directly stating what she does. Uh, but there's this one guy named uh, uh, 
Mikhail. Uh, Mikhail. Mikhail. That mm-hmm. is totally into her, and she cannot stand him. Like, she hates him. But he's this kind of trim, muscular elf mark guy. Uh, totally, like, head over heels for her, and she just absolutely hates him. But he's kind of this Gregor's gadfly, and kind of, he, 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 he easily makes friends with people uh, from, like, kind of all levels of society. Uh, and once he kind of wins their confidence, he uses any information he gains for blackmail. So he's, he's not the nicest person. Um, but despite having so many friends and acquaintances, it's hard to find anyone who will actually say something nice about him. Uh, so, you know, he, he knows a lot of people, uh, and I think they mostly stay in good terms with him because he probably knows stuff about them and they don't want to get blackmailed. Uh, so, you know, occasionally he'll, he'll even kind of stoop to robbing, uh, from clients clothing while they're soaking in the baths or something like that. So he's definitely one to watch out for. Uh, you got this guy named Radu Underhill, who's actually a Darapool. Uh, he, generally, you'll find him. I talked about him once before because generally you'll find him back in the cartways is where his kind of headquarters is. And he's a very informative person. But he also enjoys soaking in the hot pool uh, that's down there. There's there's several pools if you look at the map. There's a cold pool, a hot pool. There's massage rooms. There's all these different places. So he likes to ha- kind of hang out in the hot pool and he kind of holds court there. Uh, he occasionally will kind of hang out in the Grand Lounge playing games and stuff like that. Uh, but he does know ways into the cartways and stuff like that because he does actually um, reside there. So yeah. he knows the secret route to the cartways through the spring overflow, but he, he doesn't usually use it. But there is a way into the cartways uh, within the bathhouse. So that's kind of I mean, cool. I mean, can you imagine sitting in a bath with a ghoul? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, their are you know, a little different, but yeah, it'd, yeah. It'd, it'd I mean, be they're they're always portrayed with this this odor, you know, that they have, you know, that uh, kind of you know takes the uh, you know PCs off their game. But but God, just just the, the role playing, you know, for for that character alone, sitting in you know a bathtub with with an, an undead, essentially. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, one other cool character that's kind of there, I, I, I don't want to say cool character, but useful character, I guess, is uh, Zolst. He's kind of this middle-aged, paunchy guy. There's a little wisp of hair, uh, and he just likes to gamble. He, he kind of aspires to be wealthy, but he'll totally accept bribes. Uh, but, you know, he, he's the... Uh, he, he, he'd like the Bad House to kind of charge an entry fee to restrict its clientele uh, to, you know, better sort of focus he puts it but uh he's one of the few people in the city who actually feels that way most people kind of uh, like it the way it is so uh but he's the manager of the bathhouse so uh he's somebody you'll likely run into if you have any sort of trouble at the bathhouse there's a good chance you'll see him there so keep him in mind you know you can always slip him a few coins to take care of something or just to go away um but yeah he's i picture him kind of as as uh, just that annoying, uh, Weasley kind of manager guy, you know? Right, right. So, yeah. So, you know, there's a couple other we have locations. Some caverns, right? Yeah, yeah. A couple more locations. You know, one is actually in the uh, Crown Square, and the other one is, you know, kind of outside of it a little bit. Uh, but uh, the Seven Bells ta- Tavern, you know, this is pretty much the most important trade tavern in the district. And uh, it stands just off of Crown Square and employees, uh, in addition to a wait staff, you know, there's a scribe, a money changer, a notary, and a shipping clerk with connections to uh, barge trade and the uh, caravan master. So it's kind of like your one-stop shopping uh, to, you know, enter into a deal, create a, uh, create a contract, you know, exchange money. And, you know, everything's binding. So it's, you know, it's a part alehouse and a part um, government records office, you know. Yeah. You know, the food and drink there are reasonably good and relatively inexpensive. Um, Drinking to excess is brought upon. uh, And any attempts to duel, brawl, or gamble, you know, will result in your ejection from the premises. So this is the place to conduct business and not to conduct uh, mischief. And... You know, here here we're going to get into X card world. You know, uh, uh, one more time. Um, then there's the Silk Scabbard, uh, which is kind of uh, between 
uh, Upper Zobeck and the uh, Cobalt Ghetto. And this, yeah. this establishment is not a small operation. You know, uh, they are a brothel and fighting pit uh, that occupies a very nondescript, very large two-story brick structure uh, near the junction of Upper and Lower Zobeck and the Cobalt Ghetto. Now, Tyron, who is Lord Greymark's fixer, um, owns and runs the place with the approval and protection of the trade oligarch, you know, Greymark himself. You know, this is a den of excess, and it draws patrons of all social strata. And, uh, and fond of risk, you know, Tyron runs many games and fixes only a few. And the management sees an occasional brawl at the cost of, as the cost of doing business and keeps the, uh, you know, furniture sturdy but uh, comfortable. So, yeah, you know, you've got the fighting pits, you know, the organized fights, and then occasionally there's going to be a, a uh, impromptu fight outside of the uh, fighting pits. Yep. The silk scabbard ladies are, are, are well kept, uh, treated well. A, a local bard uh, advertises the brothel as a dozen lovely ladies and two ugly ones. That, that's kind of rude, but you know, that, that, that's what they do. Um, uh, it's too funny. This is yeah. a great establishment. Though. Like this, this is a great place to take your party in general. This has got a bit of everything. When you're looking for that that real D and D tavern that's got the fights, it's got the the brothel, it's got the gambling, it's got the booze. This is the tavern, man. Like this, this I think is one of the better taverns to take a D and D party to in general in the city, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just got it's got a bit of everything. It's even got a secret entrance to the cartways. Exactly. And you know, like the bathhouse, you know, there's a bunch of personalities there. You know, there's the mm -hmm. bouncer at Atston. Uh he has a thick accent, thicker forearms. He likes the girls, and you know, he often loses his wages on the table after he's done. You got your bartender, Drajan. You know, he keeps his head shaved and has appear and appears neat, always wearing this sleeveless vest. Uh, so he can display his tattoos. And what, what's great about this guy is he only drinks spring water. He doesn't, he doesn't partake in the hooch, you know, one, one, one bit. Uh, so, you know, he, he's, he's a big burly guy who's a teetotaler. Um, but uh, a very good character to use to, you know, try to get information out of or, or uh, suggestions on where to go next. Or even um, ideas uh, for your characters to find work. You know, your adventurers, you know, you want something to do to earn some coin. Um, there's Jitka, he's half Kariv, uh, who left his uh, Margrave clan for Zobek. And Jitka is the pit boss, and he is the undisputed ruler of the game floor. Do not mess with this guy. Um, Kaja um, is this raven haired spitfire. Uh, she watches over the uh, other ladies like a mama bear. If you offend her, you will not see the back of these rooms ever again. So make sure you're nice to uh, Kaja. Then there's uh, Tamalis Druzzledorg. Uh, he, he's this dark-haired aristocrat with a pot belly and a braided beard. He spends his days regaling listeners with his stories of ancient kingdoms, lost treasures, and unusual monsters. I mean, you can just kind of play him as an overweight, you know, the most fascinating man in the world, you know, type thing. You know, that Dos Equis commercial. Um, he's a font of knowledge, assuming that he can steer the topic of the conversation. His mouth is never shut. He's, he's interesting. His, his money never runs out. Last is uh, Tyron. He's, he's the owner. Uh, he wears this long coat, a uh, narrow broom felt hat. You know, he's tall, thin. He's, he's middle-aged. He, he tries to mimic himself like, uh, like his patron. Uh, he wears only the finest clothes. He ca carries himself with dignity and calm and disinterest. You'll never see him get angry, at least uh, publicly. Yeah. And a couple other uh, notes that, you know, I picked up on, on the Silk Scarab from Adventures and stuff. Uh, you know, there's a lot of gangs in Zobek, and there's one called the Cloven Nine, which does – kind of uh, uh, hang out there a lot. I don't want to call it their headquarters, but it's definitely one of their main hangouts. So uh, keep that in mind. Look at, check out the Cloven 9. We're going to talk about gangs and stuff like that in a later episode. But the Cloven 9 will have a, a strong presence there. And if uh, there is a map of this in the Zobek book, and this is another one I actually also made a nice 
uh, high res digital map for people to use and that I posted in our Discord server. So again, check out our Discord server and, and you can grab that map and throw it on your game. Just in a few episodes, you know, you've heard a lot of awesome places uh, in in Zobek. And in fact, uh, you know, one of my characters in Curse of Strahd Midgard, John Claude, who I like to talk about a lot, um, he actually incorporated uh, one of the uh, establishments in his uh, backstory. And, you know, we talked about the backstory uh, before hit, before we started the uh, campaign. But, uh, you know, don't be afraid to let your, your players take uh, uh, establishments uh, and incorporate it into their background. So, you know, just to give you an example, Jean-Claude Barus, um, he now is the owner of the Silk Scabbard. And uh, I describe John claude as a cross between Fabio and Brad Pitt's depiction of Louis Dupont du Lac from Interview with a Vampire. He is a total pretty boy. And that was just something that uh, Steve established uh, right from the beginning. And he acquired the Silk Scabbard, you know, three years ago from Tyron, who is, you know, in the lore, you know, the current um, owner of the Silk Scabbard, Lord Greymark's fixer. And uh, Tyron owed John Claude a substantial amount of money in gambling debts. And John Claude also had information in his possession that would ruin Lord Greymark. So the arrangement was John Claude forgave uh, Tyron's debts for the title of uh, Silk Scabbard, and Lord Greymark uh, went along with the uh, transaction to uh, keep a, a a very important secret. So Jean-Claude is now the operate, uh, operator of three competitive establishments uh, in, in Zobeck. You know, two are the Temple of Painful Pleasures and, and the Book Fetish, uh, which, you know, we'll talk about, you know, later because they're yeah. in different districts in, Roba, uh, in Zobeck. And uh, and he owns those with his, with his partner, Nerys uh, Laragorn who is a, a character described in the book. And uh, she is the uh, red goddess, uh, a cleric of the red goddess uh, Marina. And uh, so, you know, there, there's a nice, you know, hook and connection in that, that I, I hope to use in the future, you know, when they uh, return to, to Zobek. And, you know, he also uh, owns the um, Angel's Gate, you know, which was a establishment he owned uh, before he, took over the silk scabbard. So John claude has kind of a like a little mini empire, you know, nice. uh, entertainment empire in uh, in Zobek. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, um, I'll, I'll say uh, two things about all that is one, you'll find a lot of times and, and you know, we, we always say it at the end of our, our, our episodes, right? You know, uh, use it for parts, make it your own. That, that's something that Cobalt Press is big on because you'll find things intentionally left out of the text or left vague. You might be reading and go, well, you know, how does this work? Or there's no information on this. And they, you know, if you ask one of the writers that wrote that, they'll say, I did that on purpose. Do what you want mm -hmm. with it. So that's yeah. very intentional. And they literally, you know, that's one of the reasons that I fell in love with Midgard uh, is, you know, I, I've, I've said this before as a, as a fan of Dragonlance, I always felt it was so established that I'm, I break the world by changing things like that, where I feel like in Midgard, I'm encouraged to change things like that. So and break it. never be afraid to do that in Midgard. I mean, it, it's designed for you to make it your own. And the other thing is, if you if you do have a character that owns a silk scabbard or owns a business, the Tomo Heroes book has some great rules behind how you can uh, manage that and have your characters earning passive income from businesses during downtime. So there's a whole set of rules. It's not really an overly complicated set. It's very simplistic and very streamlined to allow your characters to be you know, managing a business in between their adventures. So that yeah. that's there for you to use. Yeah, and when uh, Jean-Claude finally returns to Zobek, you know, he's going to probably find himself just a little bit richer. Yeah, I would hope so, man. That That's super cool. So that's about it, I think, for Upper Zobek for today. And I think it's time to hop into our creature showcase. And I think we have some good ones today. So, you know, I think maybe, why don't you lead us off this week, Clay? Yeah, let me set this up for you. The free city of Zobek is home to many lively taverns and pubs, each offering a unique atmosphere and experience. One such establishment is the sprawling and boisterous Rusty Anchor Tavern, located near the docks. 
a place where travelers, merchants, and locals alike come to relax and indulge in their favorite ales and meads. You step through the doors of the tavern and are greeted with a warm glow of flickering candles, a clanging of mugs and glasses, and the deafening roar of laughter and song. The air is thick with the scent of roasting meats, wood smoked and spilled ale. The tavern is loud and packed with patrons, each one more rowdy and raucous than the last. But amidst the throng of revelers, as you take your seat at the bar, you notice one figure, one strange figure, one small figure that stands out. A small, scaly, plump, two-foot-long creature reclines at the table with a dazed look in his eyes and a suggestion of a grin on its fanged jaws, watching a heated card game. Is that an alehouse drake? No, it can't be. You've heard of alehouse drakes, but always thought that they were just stories. But one of the patrons at that same table, he he's pretty mad, and, and it appears he has just took a bad beat. And he stands up, suddenly draws his dagger from his belt, and readies himself to jump across the table. With a flick of its fat tail, you hear this loud burp that rattles every mug on the tables and bar, which somehow quenches the heated temper of the card players. Immediately, one of the barmaids places a bowl of frothy liquid in front of the creature, and with a wry smile on its face, the creature takes a long pull and then begins to entertain the card players with a story. The bartender places mugs of ale in front of you to help pick your jaws up off the floor. Otis, he's a mischievous one and a beloved fixture of the tavern. Patrons seem to take his antics in stride, but it's his job to help prevent fights and keep the furniture intact. He says, oh, that little scaly dragon. He's been part of my family for over 200 years. And if he likes you, he may tell you a story and regale you with some nonsensical and annoying trivia. So enjoy your evening. So alehouse drakes are small creatures. Um, they are a chaotic creature that uh, is CR 1-8 in the uh, book. So... They're, they're easy to take out if if you wanted to fight them. Uh, but they won't go, you know, quietly. But I, I do not view ale drakes as combatants. You know, ale hails drakes squat or live in busy bars, rowdy taverns, and bustling inns. And oftentimes, they uh, attach themselves to a family uh, in exchange for a generous tab and food and lodging. And, uh, you know, just a safe place to be rather than be uh, out in the wild. There are friendly alehouse drakes, of course, but there are also more devious ones. But either way, they are usually helpful, helpful enough for uh, uh, to the proprietors to earn their keep. And because they're long lived, you know, they're often passed down, you know, and I put that in air quotes, uh, to other families, you know, throughout the generations. So they can kind of keep uh, running uh, the bar, you know, in peace or or however they want the uh, alehouse uh, uh, drake to uh, operate, you know, because these creatures, they love gossip. They love spending their days drinking, joking and arguing with patrons. Um, they have a strong constitution and and can pretty much keep drinking the beer and uh, be OK, you know, for the most part. But, you know, the more devious ones, they could be a bane. Uh, to a uh, bartender, and they could just come in there to 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 cause fights or you know drive crowds into a frenzy or a rage, and, and they usually do that to you know at the beginning to uh, uh, to kind of get the to make a deal with with the uh, the owner of the taverns or inns. But um, the lore indicates that they're often troublemakers or pranksters. Uh, but kind of in the more rural inns, the coaching inns, you know, they usually uh, will befriend a family uh, of of the proprietor and help uh, manage, you know, flared tempers and weepy drinkers, you know, in return to, you know, for for food and lodging. Um, they 
tend to per, uh, perch themselves in hiding places throughout busy taverns uh, to kind of listen in on gossip and stories. Uh, and they'll often trade in information. So think, think of them as the draconic form of a bard, you know, essentially. Now, the more devious and ill-mannered alehouse drakes will resort to blackmail, uh, but usually only to uh, secure a comfortable spot uh, in their chosen tavern. The, they are charisma-based uh, spellcasters that uh, has spells like friends, vicious mockery, you know, calm emotions, dissonant whispers, ray of sickness, uh, hideous laughter. You know, so that's really their their toolbox. You know, if they uh, uh, their toolbox, you know, to kind of you know control the crowds and control people. Um, so you can use these spells to cool down or heat up a, up, up tavern patrons. You know, however you wish. Um, but what's cool is the alehouse drake also has a feature called forgetful spell casting uh, that can be used to avoid a conflict. So anytime the drake will cast a spell on its target. Uh, that creature uh, has to roll a wisdom, intelligence, or charisma saving throw against the uh, uh, alehouse drake spellcasting uh, save. And uh, if they fail, you know they'll 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 forget that a a spell was even cast on them because you know as the, as the rules state, you know people know when a when when a spell is cast on them, but they don't necessarily know who cast it. Um, but uh, melee, you know, the drake has their typical bite and claws. And uh, they do have a rechargeable breath weapon attack, you know, that is more of a nuisance attack, you know. So, you know, like I said in the setup, you know, it, it, it'll, it'll burp. Uh, but in this case, it's a cloud of uh, intoxicating gas. And uh, he does that in a 15-foot co cone. And uh, any creature that uh, fails their save uh, are stunned for about 1d6 rounds. So it's a great way to take a, a hostile creature out of the action if they fail their save. Um, the Drake Drac also has an attack called uh, Discombobulating Touch, and uh, so it's a touch attack, and uh, and it and and what happens is that the target will add plus three to Dexterity based skill checks and melee attacks, uh, but it is also under the uh, the uh, effect of a, of a a confusion spell, you know. So so it's it's. He didn't actually cast a spell, you know, he just uh, is, is under the effects of the confusion spell. And if, if you ever play that one, it's it's one of those spells where you have to roll uh, on a table to determine what your behavior is uh, during your uh, action. You know, so it could be something as simple as the creature doesn't move or take any actions or as uh, as flavorful as the creature uh, uses action to uh, make melee attacks against a randomly determined creature within reach. You know, so it's kind of like uh, you know wild magic in a in a more melee approach. So yeah, any tavern scene that uh, you use, find a way to incorporate the alehouse trick. Your players will love it. Well, that all sounds super cool, uh, and I like the theme of the tavern. So uh, I'm going to stick with that theme, though I'm going to keep this one a little more, uh, it's a little simpler, a little more streamlined, but it's one of my absolute favorites. So picture this. You're hanging out at the Silk Scabbard. And of course, the Silk Scabbard is renowned for its fighting pits. They have a couple of fighting pits down there. And, you know, patrons can choose to participate in those, in those fights. So, you know, you decide... Why not make a few extra gold and hop in the fighting pit and see what comes at you? So you get down uh -huh. in there, you're you're you know warming up, you're ready for it, and you know you're expecting you know some guy, maybe some big beefy guy or some heavy guy to come in, and suddenly, as the the dust cloud comes up, and you know your vision's obscured for a minute, and as it settles in front of you, is a short yet stocky, rippling with muscles, red cobalt, sitting there, strapped with this piecemeal armor, plates of metal tied together with scraps of leather. But his muscles are just huge. They ripple across his body. You've never seen a cobalt like this before. And your jaw just kind of hangs open as he just hunches over and just in a deep voice, he goes... <laughs> Are you kidding me? 
Do you even lift, bro? This, this is the Swobold. The nice. Swobold is probably one of my favorite characters, one of my favorite monsters in all of the monster books from Cobalt Press. It is just, the concept of it is hilarious, but I absolutely love it. These are kobolds that, through some means, whether magic or alchemy or sorcery or something, these kobolds are far stronger than any kobold that you would normally see. They are not small but fierce. They are big and fierce. They are not quick and stealthy. They are big and strong. And that's how they fight. Now, if you are dealing with kobolds, uh, you know, out in groups, maybe out in the wild, facing like, you know, a big pack of them, they might have one or two of these guys that kind of serve as like a vanguard or something like that. But around Zobek, uh, you know, these might be the, the brutes that are carrying the big heavy loads of, of ore in the mines. Uh, and they're just itching for a fight on the weekends. You know, they, they're just looking to get into bar fights. You know, where normally you're dealing with the packs surrounding you and moving and all that. These guys just come in for the bear hug. So the way these guys really work is they're, they're very simple to run in combat. They have their pack tactics and their sunlight sensitivity like any kobold. But uh, they are more designed to be these unarmed, you know, wrestler type combatants. So they do have this like leaping attack type ability where they can use the dash action. So if they're far away, they will, they will use the dash action to run in at you. And as long as they stop within five feet of you, they can make one slam attack with disadvantage as a bonus action against that creature. So even if they're dashing, they still get to make an attack. Um, it's disadvantage and it's a bonus action, but it's a slam attack nonetheless. The slam attack itself, so they have only two real actions. They have a slam and a crush, but they're made to work together. So the slam, uh, and these guys, these are just so you, uh, you know, these are a CR3 creature. So not super high level, but they, uh, the slam, the way it works is it is a plus six to hit and it's a 2d6 plus four bludgeoning damage attack. However, if the creature that they're attacking, in this case, you in the fighting pit mm. is large or a smaller creature, they get grappled. And, uh, so as, and as with any grapple, the targets are going to be restrained, but now they can't make, uh, slam attacks against you. So picture this grapple as they hit you and then they put you into a bear hug and they're holding you. So now on their next turn, if you are grappled, they just start crushing you. They just start squeezing you and trying to like break your back. So you have to make a, a DC 14 strength save or you're going to take 5d6 plus 4 bludgeoning damage on a fail. Uh, so. That's their whole thing is hit and crush, hit and crush. These guys are also resistant to bludgeoning damage. So that's something that your normal kobold won't have. But they are, like I said, they're, they're a fairly simple creature to run, which is one of the things I like about them. But I feel like they just have this, this shock and awe value. Now, with kobolds in general, pack tactics is key when you run them. Uh, you want to have those pack tactics. You want other kobolds around them. And, and this, in my fun little, you know, uh, bar scenario, uh, that's not going to be a thing. But, you know, out in the, sh if in the kobold ghetto or something like that, you pick a fight with a pack of kobolds in the streets of Zobek, and then suddenly you have this swobold come out of nowhere, it's, you know, it, it's going to change this fight significantly because you get a couple of kobolds around you and this guy's getting advantage on those attacks. Uh, and you're getting grappled, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt a lot. So if you can get one or two of these into a good group fight with, you know, several standard kobolds or, you know, kobold press has a lot of other types of kobolds as well, uh, you can get a really interesting encounter with, with a couple of these guys in it. I, I just kind of find the whole shock and awe of this big, muscular kobold. It's just super, super cool. I'd even throw one in the Strauss bathhouse because they have a they have a gymnasium down there. It'd be funny to go in there and find this pole <laughs> bowl just like lifting a bunch of weights and all the patrons like betting on if he can do it and cheering them on. <laughs> like there's just so much opportunity to do fun things with these guys. So definitely take a look at them. These guys are in Creature Codex. Uh, what are they? Page uh, 240 in Creature Codex. 
So definitely take a look at them. Uh, one of the another interesting thing about these is this was actually a um, a backer submission monster for a Creature Codex. I want to say it was one of the guys from Nerdarchy. I think maybe Ted from Nerdarchy, but I'm not sure which one of the Nerdarchy guys that designed the Soul Bolt. So, you know, fun creature kind of has become a staple. I mean, they make shirts. There's a Soul Bolt mini that they have, uh, you know, stickers, all sorts of stuff because it's a fun creature. I'm even thinking about getting a tattoo of one. <laughs> Because wow. I just really love him. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, wow. It's such cool art. Look at him, man. He's so awesome. Yeah. So uh, definitely worth checking out. Definitely a fun a fun thing to use. Kobolds in general, I think, are just fun monsters, right? Um, and, you know, you get them, if, if you play them right with their pack tactics, um, you know, kobolds are going to retreat if they don't have pack tactics. They're generally not going to fight without that advantage of numbers. Um, but a Swolbold can kind of... Uh, maybe keep them in the fight a little longer and change the dynamic of that fight. So throw, like I said, throw one or two into a pack of kobolds, uh, you know, whether that is, you know, at the silk scabbard or in the ghetto or maybe in the black market or something like that, it could really, really uh, shake things up in a kobold fight. So definitely take a look, definitely worth looking at. Um, but that easily one of my favorite monsters. Yeah. Kobolds are cool. I, I use them. Uh, in uh, in a uh, Courts of the Shadow Fate campaign, you know, one of my uh, characters was a luchador, you know, mask wrestler, very famous, you know, in Midgard, and uh, and the 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 player, you know, Matt, he was like, God, you know, can we work in a wrestling match? And and I and I said that's a great idea, you know, and I, you know we can make it like you guys are raising money, you know, to uh, uh, you know fund your campaign into the uh, court, uh, Sh- uh, Shadowfay Court. And uh, so you know I brought in some wrestling mechanics and uh, and uh, you know a couple of the opponents were Swole Balts and they frankly made you know quick work of uh, of some of the characters. Um, and, uh, it was a lot of fun, you know, it was a fun fight lasted yeah. a, a few rounds and, uh, and, uh, you know, players had a blast, you know, it was, it's was, it was nice to uh, change. I, I picture running them. I picture running them in a wrestling match, like Andre, the giant kind of deal, like just <laughs> kind of big and slow, but all they want to do is get their hands around you and, and grapple you and squeeze you. It's just bear hugs, you know? Yeah. So I, they're fun, man. They're, they're, they're just. They're they're kind of silly, they're but they're they're fun and they're definitely dangerous. So and, worth a look. So yeah, two great creatures that uh, that uh, you should really consider uh, uh, including in part of your games. Well, that's our show. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Joe, how can people reach you? Uh, yeah, as always, you can find me at GM Toolbox on YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, all those fun socials, and of course on uh, the Midgard Adventures Discord server. Uh, and on Twitter, I'm uh, GM underscore toolbox, just to clarify. So uh, how about you? Well, you can always reach me on the Midgard Adventures Discord server. I'm at Clayton Thompson, and that's Thompson without a P. Uh, we also have a dedicated channel for that Midgard show on the server where you can post a comment and talk about the sh- content on the show. Um, on the sh- server itself, you know, there's a whole bunch of channels. You know, you can hang out with other fans of Midgard in our Mead Hall. Uh, or uh, any other channel that's available. We have channels on lore, channels on uh, particular adventures. Uh, anything that you can imagine is is available there. Uh, there's an invite to the server uh, available below in the show notes. You can also leave a comment in the section below, and uh, we're, we'll dedicate some time in future shows to start reading some of the comments. Uh, we've been getting a lot of great uh, uh, comments and questions yeah, we really appreciate everybody's feedback. It's been really great. Um, you know, we're doing our best here and we hope to keep improving. So definitely leave, leave that feedback and we'll do our best. So, and you know, like you said, if you like our show, please make sure you click on the like button and subscribe to the channel. Uh, we're also on all the major pl- podcast platforms. So you, know, you can always subscribe there, leave us a, a five-star review and even better, make sure you're spreading the word about the Midgard show. So yeah. And you know, guys, remember as Wolfgang says, Strip it for parts and make it your own. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, everybody. 